proud, obstinate, stubborn, disobedient, unfaithful, a grumbler. This was Jonah, whose name means dove. Jonah was the son of Amittai, a Zebulun native from Gath Hefer, called Gittah Hefer in Joshua 19, 10-13. He was the earliest of the prophets and close behind Elisha in his place in the Old Testament. The story of Jonah is told in the brief 48 verses but powerful book of Jonah. When God summoned Jonah to warn the violent and godless Ninevites of their impending doom, Jonah ran away and he fled to Joppa and obtained a ship bound for Tarshish, which was in the opposite direction as Nineveh. Jonah 1, 1-3 The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. A human father would probably have rejected Jonah and found someone else to deliver his message to Nineveh. If God has a plan for someone, his gifts and calling are irrevocable, and he will either fulfill his plan or simply pass to accomplish what he has planned. Isaiah 46, 9-10 Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God caused a violent storm to threaten the safety of his ship and its crew. This unceremonious awakening also awakened Jonah to the fact that, far from being an artful dodger, he was being followed by the Almighty. Jonah 1, 4-17 Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. At this point, Jonah has found himself in a situation worse than he could have imagined, but like Jacob, he has realized that God is with him wherever he goes, whether in obedience or disobedience. As a result, a beautiful prayer of faith rises from the belly of the great fish, tinged with spiritual pride. Jonah 2, 1-10 From inside the fish Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the deep in the realm of the dead I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head, to the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, 
I remember you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warnings reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Jonah 3, 1-10 But to Jonah this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I am so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Jonah 4, 1-11 through But there is one major issue that we have yet to address in depth. Why did Jonah flee his assignment? This is the topic of Jonah chapter 4, which is seldom taught, preached, or even read. Nonetheless, it is at the heart of the story. What was the source of Jonah's reluctance? What was he thinking? Some claim he was primarily thinking of himself. He was only afraid of going to Nineveh because he feared being impaled as an Assyrian enemy. This, however, does not explain why he suggested that the sailors toss him into the sea. He wasn't afraid of death in the traditional sense. Second, he is said to have believed that Gentiles had no right to hear about the God of Israel. We could call it anti-Gentilism. This, however, does not explain why he fled to the Gentiles in Tarsus. Others believe he was thinking of the Assyrians, the most villainous people on the planet. But more importantly, he was thinking of Israel. Because Assyria was the greatest threat to tiny Israel, and he didn't want anything to do with the potential invader. None of these solutions take Jonah's words into account. He had warned the people of Nineveh that God would destroy their city in 40 days. The people all repented as a result of his preaching. The worst case scenario was averted. An evangelist would be overjoyed if the entire city repented. But Jonah was let down. I told you this would happen, he said to God as he sat on a hill outside the town. I understand how you feel. I knew you would let them off the hook. I knew you'd threaten them with destruction but then back down. Isn't it true that Jonah wants people to be saved? 
Is he so close-minded and bigoted that he refuses to allow people to repent? The key is his reference to something he said to God in his own country. O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That's why I fled to Tarshish so quickly. I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. To find out what happened to Jonah in his own land, we must turn to 2 Kings 14, 23-25. When he was called to be a prophet, he was sent to King Jeroboam II of Israel, a notoriously bad king who did evil in the Lord's sight. When God told Jonah to go to the king, he initially responded positively, believing that he would be able to deal with the king's wickedness. But the message given to Jonah was not what he had expected. Go and tell the king that I want to bless him, that I am going to enlarge his borders and make him great, the Lord said. Jonah objected claiming that he was a wicked king and that this was the wrong strategy. In his heart, he was saying to the Lord, It'll never work, Lord. Blessing bad people only makes them worse. The king did, in fact, deteriorate. The more God blessed him, the worse he became. As a result, Jonah concluded that mercy does not change wicked people. Jonah is telling God that he understands God's business better than God does. As a result, Jonah's attitude toward Nineveh was influenced by the previous episode. Let's just see what happens, Lord, he said. I'm just going to keep an eye on this city to see if you're letting them go will cure them or make them worse. All of this stems from Jonah's envy of the Lord's character and reputation. He couldn't stand it when people took advantage of God's mercy. He thought their repentance was fleeting and would not last. He reasoned that if God was too gentle with them, they would conclude that he never follows through on his threats of judgment. Jonah's prophecy would be questioned, even mocked, and eventually forgotten. When the plant grew up alongside him, he was grateful because it provided him with shade from the sun. But when the worm ate the roots, it died, and Jonah became enraged once more. He asked God why he had killed it. God told Jonah that he had every right to be angry about the plant. But did he have the same right to be angry about Nineveh? There were over 125,000 children in the city, as well as many cattle. Didn't God have a right to care about them? So while Jonah was jealous for the Lord because he did not want the Assyrians to escape punishment, he did not understand God's compassion, his desire to postpone punishment as long as possible. That is why he ran away to the sea and why the success of his preaching was so hollow for him. We too forget how patient God is, how merciful he is, and how many chances he wants to give people. Of course, there comes a time when God's patience runs out. This is ultimately the message of the prophets. Jonah simply miscalculated the timing. It was still the time of God's mercy and patience with Nineveh in his day.